The story begins in the desolate landscape of a destroyed world, where lifeless creatures are scattered about. The God of Destruction yelled, Behold, last of humanity, victory is mine, with triumph-etched expression on his face. His enormous sword pierced our protagonist with a thunderous blow, causing him to cough in pain and spill blood from his lips. He looked fixedly at the Demon King while relying heavily on his reliable sword, fully aware that he represented humanity's last hope. It was a world devoid of hope. Since the humans' devastating defeat in the war against the demons a year earlier, even though the majority of humanity had been brutally murdered, the conflict's echoes persisted. Those who were able to survive were subjected to a fate worse than death. They were reduced to nothing more than vessels used in the birth of monstrous creatures, and their minds were stripped of all autonomy. Our protagonist continued to fight alone against insurmountable odds as the only resistance army survivor in this gloomy reality. Tartarus, the god of obliteration and leader of evil spirits, commented with a sprinkle of joke in his voice, You are by all accounts in desolation. Permit me to offer some break. Tartarus stated, his voice darkly amused, I've extended your lifespan just enough for us to engage in a brief conversation. He continued, Ah, Zephyr, the name rings a bell. As he got closer to Zephyr, you were the first person to challenge me so relentlessly, and you've been a persistent annoyance. Your persistence is to be sure vital, conceded Tartarus, recognizing Breeze's flexibility. It is common knowledge that no fool would persist in a losing cause. But those who give in to fear and give up without fighting are nothing but weak, Tartarus said with contempt, his disdain for weakness evident. I despise weak competitors. Their absence of resolve disturbs me. Considering that you've ascended as the zenith of your species, you should appreciate my opinions, he commented, noticing Breeze's fatigued state. Permit me to make an offer, Tartarus continued, concentrating on Zephyr. Me too. He offered Zephyr an unprecedented offer of power and conquest, promising, we shall together transcend this insignificant realm and conquer everything, even the domain of the gods. Do you really mean it? Is it really possible for me to support your cause? Asked Breeze, his voice loaded down with incredulity and a touch of interest. Certainly, Tartarus smiled, confirming his offer with a dark sense of amusement. That's quite the proposition, Zephyr jokingly responded. However, he was aware, deep down, of the extent of his wounds from the recent battle. He was fully aware that his body couldn't be fixed and that recovery was out of the question. Zephyr realized that Tartarus had ulterior motives that were hidden behind the apparent offer. It was not a genuine offer. Tartarus intended to observe Bree's forlorn acquiescence. He wanted to see Zephyr, the person who had lost everything, beg for his life from an adversary who had taken everything away from him. As Breeze connected towards Tartarus, a memory streaked through his psyche, a memory of a denounced lady him for his exorbitant hostility and obscenity. She had cast a spell on him that appeared to be absurd in response to his stubbornness after warning him against his reckless behavior. She had stated, A tremendous burst of power from another dimension will obliterate me if I perform a certain action with my hand. Zephyr also made the decision to unleash his response to the Demon Lord's offer at that crucial moment when he was facing Tartarus. To your proposal, Tartarus, Lord of Demons, I will respond as follows. Screw you. Breeze expressed disobediently. He thought he had caught Tartarus off guard in an energy explosion, but the God of Destruction was also engulfed in the blast. Zephyr, you son of a... How dare you humiliate me like this, you pathetic human! Echoed the furious scream of Tartarus. Zephyr's long-fought battle appeared to come to an end in that cataclysmic moment. It appeared as though his efforts had failed to avenge his loved ones and save humanity from extinction. A somber conclusion to his valiant struggle was anticipated, or so it ought to have appeared. Zephyr felt his hand twitch as he lay on the ground, amazed to find himself still alive. What's going on? He contemplated in dismay. He was certain that he had just passed away. When he noticed that his wounds had miraculously healed, a wave of confusion washed over him. When he ran his fingers over his armor, he noticed that the plates had been replaced and looked like they had never been damaged. Where are you? Zephyr asked out loud because he was unsure of the answer. As he studied his environmental factors, 
he saw images suggestive of the divine beings. Is this a temple of some kind? He was perplexed by the unfamiliar architecture around him and wondered. He had never seen anything like this before in a temple. Pondering his conditions, Breeze induced. This should be eternity, the domain of the hidden world. He came to the realization, which added to his predicament's surreal quality. He concluded that he had entered the realm of the gods or their enigmatic underworld due to the combination of healed wounds, clean armor, and an otherworldly atmosphere. This is not the dark side. In the glistening light, a voice echoed. It's the deepest level of the pantheon where the gods live. A beautiful blonde woman with four perfectly white wings that hung from her back and made her look like an angel suddenly appeared. Surprised, Zephyr instinctively reached for his sword but was unable to summon it. The realization temporarily paralyzed him, so he paused. The calm angelic figure reassured Zephyr, do not be alarmed. I am the God's messenger. Mercedes is my name. I am a member of the elite angelic ranks. Her ethereal presence and quiet disposition controlled the pressure that had held Breeze. As she introduced herself as a herald representing the divine beings that were residing within the inner sanctum of the Pantheon, he looked at her, trying to make sense of the absurdity of the situation. Mercedes went on to say, you're already dead. His spirit would typically swiftly travel to the underworld. However, the Triumvirate of Supreme Gods has made an unprecedented decision to transport him back in time at the insistence of numerous deities. Surprised, Zephyr asked, what do you mean? The angel went on to say that Zephyr would be taken back to the past with all of his memories and consciousness intact. It was a chance for him to modify the result of previous occasions, to change the finish of his story. But there was a catch. Only his memories would survive this journey through time. His physical prowess, acquired skills, and prowess would not return to their previous levels. Mercedes reassured him by stating that Zephyr, regarded as the most powerful human, was capable of rapidly regaining his lost abilities and strengths in spite of this limitation. She expressed optimism that he would quickly regain his previous skill and overcome this obstacle. Zephyr's thoughts were clouded by doubts as he considered his situation. He considered whether this experience was a simple dream or a deception created by Tartarus. It could have been a dream or a sign of his impending death. Breathing out profoundly, he voiced his vulnerability, provoking the holy messenger to scrutinize the purpose for giving him another opportunity. Why provide me with this opportunity? In the midst of the perplexing circumstances, Zephyr inquired with skepticism. The angel said, I understand your skepticism, sensing his hesitation. You want evidence. But let's say I share your belief. What do you anticipate from me? Everything has a price attached to it. Your offer of a second chance does not come from pure kindness, does it? Bree's examining question expected to uncover the basic intentions behind the help from above. Thinking that there were ulterior thought processes driving the divine being's activities, he held on to a doubt that this additional opportunity was not a magnanimous gift, yet rather a way to satisfy the divine being's own cravings. People all over the country prayed fervently for help as the God of Destruction launched his invasion and the massacre began. Be that as it may, the divine beings insensitively got some distance from their requests. They disregarded the prayers and any additional offerings made by the desperate populace. They even deprived the priests of their divine power, which they had been borrowing to defend against the impending doom, in an act of betrayal. The once powerful human army collapsed almost immediately, unable to heal or defend themselves. In their cold calculation, the gods had decided that their realm had nothing more to offer. They cruelly abandoned the mortals with this verdict, leaving them to face extinction on their own. It was shocking to learn that these celestial beings, who were once revered and worshipped, were nothing more than indifferent beings who were unwilling to provide assistance without payment. Their surrender left an unpleasant taste, as mankind understood that the divine beings could never give their help without anticipating something consequently. Mercedes responded to Zephyr's inquiry, very well. Give the gods themselves permission to explain, they desire something more captivating, she went on to say. Mercedes' response surprised Zephyr. She went on to say that some gods had been watching him and were disappointed to have seen him die. 
It was a phenomenal unique case for a human confronted with impending passing to show such faithful assurance as late as possible. The divine beings had been significantly dazzled by Bree's unrivaled flexibility in fighting against the tireless satanic powers for a stunning five years. Their interest had been piqued by his unwavering struggle. Zephyr was moved by Mercedes's words. She went on to say that many gods had been saddened to see him leave the mortal world so soon. She went into detail about how Zephyr seemed to have a lucky break as the end got closer. Unbeknownst to him, the divine beings had broadened their help, regardless of the karmic cost they caused in doing as such. However, Zephyr unleashed a beam of intense blue aura toward the angel before Mercedes could finish her sentence. Fools! Bree's voice resounded with fierceness. Did you find our struggle amusing? As he confronted them, his rage flared to the brim. Merely for your amusement, watching us fight so hard for our lives? His clenched hands held, a brilliant blue air radiating from his grip. Is that why we battled? To be your diversion. Is that all you consider our worth? Bree's accusatory words rang out, loaded up with dissatisfaction and disdain. Mercedes summoned a massive foot that struck Zephyr and brought him to his knees. Show some regard. The divine beings are noticing, she rebuked as she moved toward Breeze. Mercedes sought to correct his misconception by leaning in. You seem to have misunderstood, she began in a calm and firm voice. The gods only found you to be intriguing. As a species, humans have never piqued their interest. If you want anything from them, they want proof of your worth. She went on to emphasize the idea that neither an individual nor an entire species can receive anything for free in this world. Zephyr said, There is another, trying to find a better explanation for his sudden resurrection. I've had enough of waiting. I want to see your manager right now, Tartarus asked the angels with a firm voice. The male heavenly messenger, attempting to diffuse the circumstance, argued, Please, sir, your request is being processed right now. I have ruled ten worlds. A normal person could never hurt me. It never happened, Tartarus affirmed strongly. I would like it taken out of the records. He ordered with authority. Make it disappear immediately, refusing to accept any sign of vulnerability in his history of conquests. Noticing Tartarus raising free for all, Breeze murmured to himself. What on earth would he say he is doing? Zephyr's world was one of ten destroyed by Tartarus, the powerful god of destruction. His desire is to demolish however many universes as could be allowed, made sense of Mercedes. He has won every battle he has fought without losing a single one. She emphasized how significant Zephyr's unprecedented accomplishment was. That flawless record was shattered by Zephyr. Do you realize how much of a blow that was to his enormous pride? Realizing Tartarus' ulterior motive for wanting to bring Zephyr back, Zephyr silently considered. That insignificant child of a... He smoldered deep down. He believes a rematch should re-establish his perfect record. Zephyr was then asked, What do you say, Zephyr? By the angel. Zephyr responded, Are you kidding me? With a wry smile, I'll gladly oblige and put an end to him if he's so eager for defeat. Zephyr's return to the past was initiated by the angel. He would be shipped to an irregular second previously, however furnished with the strength he required. In addition, as a token of their support, the gods promised him some advantageous advantages. He could use these gifts as soon as he went back in time, allowing him to change the course of history. I detest that it's coming from those repugnant gods, but an opportunity is an opportunity. Zephyr pondered introspectively as his determination solidified. This is my chance to exact my revenge. Not only against Tartarus, but also against all those gods who thought we were insignificant, he resolved internally. The directions have been set. The process is finished. I'm just waiting on the gods' final approval to manipulate space-time. Best of luck, Breeze. Mercedes said, I trust you'll deliver a spectacle for us as he opened the gate to begin his time travel. Hello, he's not relaxing. One member of the group was worried. Crap, we're in deep trouble now. Man, quiet down. Hello, awaken. Please, new guy, wake up. Zephyr's head was sprayed with water by another individual. He did indeed open his eyes. It couldn't be any more obvious. I let you know he wasn't dead, 
declared a striking man. What? Who are these people? Zephyr thought to himself as he struggled with his confusion. They appear to be recognizable. He suddenly remembered something. Oh, this brand, I recollect now. He laughed in acknowledgement. He realized what was going on. He had been transported back 10 years to when he was 20 by the gods. The group began to be curious. What is transpiring there? Asked the leader of the team. A blondie man, bearing a cross-formed scar all over, interposed. Nothing, sir. He warned Zephyr. Hey, punk, if you try anything like that again, you're dead. As they locked eyes. Zephyr replied, unperturbed. Whatever, and turned away, provoking the blonde man. What on earth did you say? Another member, who urged them to return to work, restrained the blonde man from reacting. The child expressed his gratitude, saying, Thanks, mister, for protecting me. Zephyr, on the other hand, was unfamiliar with the child. He reasoned that certain details had vanished from his memory over the past ten years. He thought to himself, readjustment will be difficult. Zephyr thought about his new skills. He remembered, recalling the angel's instructions, that he only needed to say, unlock perks, whenever he wanted to activate his benefits. Zephyr took advantage of the opportunity to hide behind a large rock, away from the busy miners. He whispered, unlock perks, when the coast was clear and no one was looking at him. He was surrounded by a golden aura, and as he marveled at the blessings bestowed upon him by the gods, he grinned. Did you see the new guy? Asked Chapter 2, the blonde miner remarked admiringly. He's something else. He works extremely effectively. Keep thinking about whether he's had insight in mining previously, considered the subsequent excavator. Watching Breeze quick digging. Breeze worked perseveringly, mining packs loaded with coal, dazzling everyone around him. Damn, because of him, we can't afford to slack off either, the second miner remarked, while the first miner expressed a desire to join Zephyr's team. Zephyr couldn't believe what was going on amid the bustle. Wow, is this true? He murmured, still processing the bizarre nature of the situation. A second prior, he murmured open advantages. That's a lot of information all at once, Zephyr exclaimed, confused by the plethora of super high level skills and items at his disposal at once. A portion of these abilities are totally new to me, he commented, flabbergasted. He grinned and said, I can't believe the gods granted me all this. In any case, his party was interfered with by the top of the mining group. How are you? I advised you to return to your spot. Do you believe that just because it is your first day, I will be gentle with you? The miners were reprimanded by the team leader, who barked. You lazy people never pay attention, even when politely asked. This will instruct you. He yelled and whipped Zephyr with his whip. Zephyr grabbed the whip with his own hands, shocking the man to no end, surprising everyone. With only his bare hands, how did he catch the whip? The man heaved in dismay. Sir, I'm sorry. Zephyr bowed respectfully and apologized. I'll get back to work. The man was completely taken aback by Zephyr's response as he walked away, glancing at his own hand. I possess considerable combat experience, so catching his sluggish whip was a breeze. Zephyr thought to himself. However, I am amazed that it did not even scratch me. Perk 1. The Iron Fortress skill significantly increases durability. The user is resilient and resists fatigue without easily falling victim to damage below their durability threshold. I feel no weakness by any means. Zephyr thought to himself, confident that he could continue this forever. This ability may appear to be a little tricky to use, but if used correctly, it could be extremely beneficial. Not a terrible beginning for his debut perk. He anticipated that combining these nine benefits with his future knowledge would speed up his return to his previous capabilities. For the time being, hard work was most important. By day's end, Zephyr had successfully mined 20 bags of coal. Let's tally up today's yield. Here are the rankings, announced the manager. Team F takes the lead, announced the results. The young boy expressed his astonishment, exclaiming, Wow, sweet, Zephyr, surprised to learn the kid was on his team, glanced at the amazed boy. Team B secures second place, the announcement continued. The blonde man, who Zephyr had encountered earlier, eyed him with disdain. What? 
How on earth did those guys come in first? He questioned incredulously. Team H claims the third spot. The results continued. And finally, Team E finishes in last place. The head miner announced, As per the mining team's policy, the food from the last place team will be distributed among the top three teams. Zephyr glanced back at the team that had landed in last place, noticing their disappointment over the prospect of going without food that night. Commence your prayers to the great goddess of light, Arya, instructed the head miner. The chorus echoed, Almighty Arya, deliver us with your eternal light. Redeem us? Not likely. Zephyr scoffed inwardly, clapping his hands in a sarcastic gesture. The temple devoted to Arya, the goddess of light and one of the three supreme gods, served as the predominant religious institution and the primary moneylender in the region. Among its inhabitants were many who had either lost their homes to monsters or were once adventurers like Zephyr. However, once indebted to the temple with overwhelming medical expenses, they became slaves to repay their debts. For Zephyr, bearing the slave mark meant being tethered to this place indefinitely. If he dared to depart without permission, the mark would trigger a fatal consequence. His heart would cease, ending his life instantly. Zephyr aimed to settle his debts swiftly, eager to secure his freedom and advance to the subsequent phase of his strategy. With determination burning in his eyes, he vowed, Tartarus, you won't defeat me so effortlessly this time. I'm going to retaliate for everything you've done. He placed a hand over his chest, addressing his lover. And Altair, this time I'll shield you. I won't let you down. Anyone in need of items from the store or seeking consultation, please come this way, announced a priestess adorned in a white and gold attire. Zephyr couldn't help but be astonished by the exorbitant prices that persisted even after all these years. Excuse me, sir, can I buy you a drink? Asked the young boy from Zephyr's mining team. Zephyr raised an eyebrow. Do you have any money? He inquired skeptically. I just got some and I can't afford anything expensive, but I appreciate you for saving me from those guys earlier and thanks to you our team came in first, the boy replied earnestly. Everyone in our team is really weak, so we usually end up in last place. This is almost the first time we've earned any money, he explained further. I understand now. That's why they targeted him. If even one person falls ill and can't work, the team's productivity suffers. So if a team sabotages another, it automatically improves their own ranking, Zephyr realized. Are you serious? I can't let a kid pay for me. I have my pride, Zephyr remarked. I didn't mean to offend you, responded the boy apologetically. I just stepped in to stop those guys because they were bothering you. Don't get close to me, kid. You'll only hold me back, Zephyr said dismissively, waving his hand as he walked away, leaving the boy behind. Welcome. What can I get you? greeted the bartender. Zephyr inquired if the barkeeper had any restorative water. I haven't seen you around here before. Are you new? Do you have any money? asked the barkeeper. Those cost one gold per glass and four gold for a bottle. I'd suggest waiting it out if you're not hurt that badly. Here's 1.5 gold, and I'll take out a loan for the rest, Zephyr said, smiling at the barkeeper. You offer loans here, right? Give me the paperwork. Overhearing Zephyr's conversation, the little boy trembled and exclaimed, Are you out of your mind? Do you have any idea how scary it is to take on even more debt? They already take one gold from our daily wage of two gold to pay our debt. If you don't have any income, you go into the red. The boy yelled at Zephyr. Zephyr simply told the boy to be quiet as he popped open a bottle of recovery water. Whatever, I'll just pay it back, he said as he drank the recovery water. The recovery water was a popular item at the temple, known for its ability to slightly regenerate endurance. However, what most people didn't realize was that it could significantly boost one's mana if consumed in large quantities. Normally, Drinking over ten bottles at once was required to get even a modest boost, making it less effective. But with this new perk, it became as potent as any potion available. Perk 2, Hermes's Hidden Skill, maximizes the potency of all potions, increases effectiveness by 500%. I can't earn much from the mines anyway. There's no bonus for working extra hard. So, what's my plan, you wonder? Well, what's that? You heard a monster deep in the mine said the head miner. Yes, sir. You should inform the hunting team. I'll guide them to the source of the sound. 
Dungeons are where the real money lies, remarked Zephyr with a smile. Monsters are created due to a disruption in mana, and historically most have been hostile toward humans, causing significant problems. Paradoxically, they've also offered certain benefits to humanity. Mana stones are formed within the creature's bodies, while their bones and hides serve as valuable raw materials. Over time, people recognized monsters as a valuable resource. As a result, monster lairs or dungeons are now viewed as perilous treasure troves. The hunting teams are composed of a specially selected group of slaves possessing combat expertise. Due to the peril they encounter while battling monsters, their standard pay is considerable, supplemented by bonuses tied to their achievements and performance. Zephyr wondered why he, an adventurer, was made to work in the mines. He was lost in thought when the barkeeper interrupted, saying he couldn't lend any more money to Zephyr. Confused, Zephyr asked if he had reached the daily limit for borrowing money. The barkeeper replied that he had already borrowed the maximum amount allowed. Feeling disappointed, Zephyr worried if he'd have to resort to stealing. Then, a priestess suggested he could borrow more by selling some of his organs to the temple for research purposes. Zephyr hesitated, considering the offer. He agreed to the priestess's offer and asked for the necessary paperwork, which she gladly provided. Zephyr scheduled the operation for the following week and asked if he could cancel it by repaying the loan. The priestess reassured him, saying they weren't predatory lenders, and he could cancel the operation by paying back the loan. Shocked, the barkeeper asked, Have you lost your mind? Why would you sell your organs? After completing the paperwork, Zephyr requested more bottles of recovery water from the barkeeper, who grumbled in response. It's your life, not mine, he muttered. The priestess observed Zephyr with admiration, thinking, Wow, sir, you're really something. The barkeeper sighed, feeling resigned. There goes another one who'll end up in the lab. The priestess was taken aback by the number of bottles Zephyr drank at once. After finishing all the recovery water, Zephyr smiled feeling satisfied that he met the requirements. Suddenly, three knights appeared and inquired, Are you Zephyr, the one who's going to guide us to the monster? Zephyr grinned, thinking it was perfect timing. Yes, that's me, he replied. One of the knights introduced himself, saying, I'm Gote, the leader of the recon unit, and these two behind me are Dale and Marco. I don't have night vision, but I can use mana detection, Zephyr mentioned while shaking the knight's hand. Night vision helps to see in the dark, whereas mana detection spreads mana to heighten one's senses. These skills are essential for sneaking into a dark dungeon without alerting any monsters inside. That'll save me from buying a night vision potion. If you're ready, we'll leave right away, said one of the knights, handing his belongings to Zephyr. The third knight, whose face was obscured by a hood, smirked. Wow, a mana-using miner? Cool. Is he going to beat the dungeon for us? He added. Gota reprimanded, shut up, Dale, as Zephyr followed behind the three knights. Zephyr recognized one of the people in the group. He knew two of them were new to him. He had an idea about their fate. Two might not make it out of the dungeon alive. He had a plan to use this to his advantage. Approaching the miner's cave, they encountered a group of knights waiting for them. They were the standby unit. One of the knights asked them to extend their hands. He tied a blue rope around each person's wrist. These are magic bracelets. If something happens to one of you, the matching bracelet on your wrist will break. Then you can call for help from the main base, he explained. But it was just a recon mission, so they should be safe if they were careful. Good luck, he said, waving them off. As they entered the mining tunnel, Zephyr took the lead while moving deeper in. Inside, dog-like monsters armed with fire and weapons were patrolling. A small stone accidentally hit the wall near the monsters, catching their attention. Engrossed by the rolling stone, two knights stealthily ambushed the creatures from behind, swiftly cutting their necks. The recon unit's main tasks are to scout for monsters and collect details about the dungeon. With this information, a strike unit is assembled, using their strength to clear the dungeon. That's typically the process. Sir, our task is just to explore the dungeon. Let's not take any extra risks, advised Dale. What if there's a bunch of monsters inside, or stronger ones? There are only three of us, Dale stated. No, there are four. That's enough to handle kobolds, replied Gota. Are you serious? He doesn't count. He's just carrying our stuff. How can we manage a dungeon by ourselves? 
Dale pointed at Zephyr. Okay, let's calm down a bit. Sir, do you have a plan? I'd like to know before we make any decisions. Smirking, Gote asked Zephyr to take the moonbush leaves and berries from the pouch. He explained that if those were ground up and mixed with kobold excrement, it would emit a scent resembling a female kobold in heat. Dale covered his mouth from the stench as Zephyr began to grind the berries. The smell is quite intense, strong enough to travel over 300 feet. The kobold began panting as it caught a whiff of the potion, then dashed swiftly toward the scent. Eventually, the kobold slipped and fell into a hole, a trap set by the knights. See? I told you it would work, Gota remarked. Wow, you're a genius sometimes, sir, Marco praised. Sometimes? You mean all the time? replied Gote with a chuckle. How did you even think of bringing that plant? I've never heard of it, questioned Marco. Gota laughed and credited his insight to experience and maturity, but in truth it was Zephyr who had informed him about it. In Zephyr's previous life before being resurrected, he worked alongside Gote in the same unit after being transferred to the hunting team. Despite his desire for recognition, he never got the chance to achieve it. Just before the team meeting, Zephyr spoke to Gota privately, mentioning that he had ventured in and checked out the area by himself the day before. Everything's clear, Zephyr informed Gota. You went in alone? How many lives do you have? Gota asked, surprised. In his previous party, Zephyr was responsible for reconnaissance, and he had a talent for locating things. So with a plan like that, you think the four of us could handle the dungeon by ourselves? Gota questioned. It's your call, sir but I believe you should think about it, Zephyr responded. Gota grinned. It'd be a shame to share an easy dungeon like this with others. This guy could be really helpful. Moonbushes aren't easy to find either. I appreciate his preparation and knowledge about hunting monsters. I also admire that he gives credit instead of taking it for himself, Gota thought. As the head of the unit, I could easily get him transferred to the hunting team with just a word to the human resources department. He's probably trying to impress me for that reason. Too bad. I can see he's a hard worker, but I'm not that desperate. Clearing one little kobold dungeon isn't enough to impress me. Nevertheless, I'll gladly take credit for clearing this dungeon, considering your efforts, mused Gota as he handed Zephyr a dagger. All right, that should pretty much handle them, Gota remarked, spearing a kobold. I didn't expect this to be so simple, chuckled Marco as he slammed another kobold with his hammer. Shame the mana stones won't fetch much, dealing with just kobolds. This path's clear now, too, said Zephyr. All right, then let's go and finish up, Gota replied, interrupted by Dale's caution. Hold on, there's something ahead. He spotted scattered bones. Are these leftovers or animal bones? Zephyr questioned. No, these look like kobold remains, Dale answered before a massive claw grabbed him and hurled him across the chamber. Marco quickly imbued his hammer with mana, shielding them. I thought we were done. What in the world is hiding here? Never mind, let's cover up and get out. My mana shield can withstand anything, Marco asserted, but the creature's tail shattered his shield, striking him hard. Gota, surprised, uttered, That tail? Impossible? The tail struck Gota once more. Beyond the mining tunnel, the standby knights noticed three bracelets snapping at once. What's happening in there? Blood dripped from Gota's arm as he struggled to comprehend how he survived the attack. When he glanced up, he saw Zephyr blocking the beast's assault. Zephyr's perk one, the skill wall of iron, activated, but his arms throbbed from the impact. The wall of iron couldn't fully deflect it. This creature is likely less than a year old, yet it's incredibly potent. The monster's tail lifted Dale's body while it fixed a fierce gaze on Zephyr, a predator. It manipulates pheromones to deceive other monsters, making them believe it's part of their pack. Then, once it matures, it turns on those monsters, consuming them and abandoning its nest. May I borrow this? Zephyr asked. Gote, taken aback, questioned, Wait, what's going on? Zephyr picked up the spear, a smirk appearing on his face. Finally, a chance to get properly warmed up. Blue mana formed in his left hand. Now, tell me something. How would you prefer me to end you? Perk 3. Silver Key. Unlocks a door in an ancient castle. Grants the holder access to a silver room, allowing the storage of items anytime and anywhere. Currently stored in the left hand. Essentially, it works like an inventory. Dragonweed and a piece of cloth. Dragonweed is a natural tonic that calms the mind. 
Zephyr, concentrating, gestured for Gota to step aside. He wrapped the bandage around the spear he had just picked up. This is going to be intense, Zephyr warned Gota, showing his strong determination. Shocked by Zephyr's resolve, Gota asked, What are you doing? You're not even a soldier. But Zephyr ignored his remarks. As Gota slowly rose to his feet, he grappled with his inner thoughts. I know my fate will come one day, but I won't meet it cowering behind a miner like this. The beast's howl pierced Gote's soul, an ability inducing fear. It immobilized its opponents with dread. Overwhelmed, Gota slumped back to the ground, trembling uncontrollably. His mind flashed back to a story shared by an experienced soldier years ago when an adult predator attacked a nearby town. The people stood petrified, unable to even blink or move their bodies, paralyzed by sheer terror, awaiting their dire fate. Witnessing the scene before him, Gota was astonished. Zephyr stood undeterred by the predator's fear-inducing skill, fighting the monster without succumbing to paralysis. As the predator roared, Zephyr evaded its attack, swiftly maneuvering and then charging at the beast. It seemed exactly as Zephyr anticipated, adept at negating fear. He expelled the dragon weed, a tonic known for calming the mind. Zephyr's second perk activated, significantly boosting the potency of all potions. Out of the nine perks, only one functions as a weapon. Right now I can't utilize it due to the enormous amount of mana it demands. However, handling a creature like that should be effortless with this. Number 68 of the 72 Deadly Poisons of Fade Belial. Zephyr recollected a conversation from his previous life with Fade. Are you certain about this, Fade? You've dedicated your life to creating these formulas. Are you sure you want to freely give them away? Zephyr inquired. Fade responded, What's the point of keeping them to myself when the world is heading towards its end? I'd rather see them used than wasted. In fact, I earnestly want you to use them. If my poison can eliminate even one more of those monsters and save just one more life, it would bring me immense happiness. Zephyr sliced at the predator, injuring the creature. Belial, a lethal poison derived from a common plant, permeates the bloodstream, corroding organs, and inducing excruciating pain. This poison's effects, crafted by the sadistic master of poisons, Fade, take about three minutes to fully spread through the body. Zephyr continued to strike the predator, but it retaliated by thrashing its tail, slamming Zephyr against a wall. With a deafening roar, the predator lunged at him. In a swift move, Zephyr tossed the potent poison into the beast's mouth, leaping over it as it collided into the wall where Zephyr had just been standing. The creature bellowed, a pool of blood trickling from its mouth. With just a minute left, or perhaps even less, Zephyr gripped his spear, acknowledging that his current skills weren't enough for a complete escape. He had two options, wait for the predator to collapse or defeat it. The predator lashed its tail at Zephyr once more, propelling him into the air. Zephyr held on, biding his time until the deadly poison took effect. When he freed himself from the predator's tail, he readied his spear to strike at the creature's head. Driving his spear into the beast's eye, it elicited a tremendous roar of agony. As the predator swung its tail again, snapping the spear in two, Zephyr seized the broken piece and drove it once more into the beast's eye. Following that, he used the dagger given by Gota to pierce the other eye. Despite the creature's frantic attempts to dislodge him, Zephyr believed there was still one more decisive strike left. He leaped back onto the beast. Ten years into the past, Zephyr was aware he wasn't strong enough in his present form to outmatch or outlast the predator. Hence, he had prepared in advance by having recovery water. What many didn't know was its ability to significantly enhance mana when consumed in large quantities. Ordinarily, over ten bottles would barely give a boost, but with his perk too, Hermes' secret skill, its efficacy was heightened. Now empowered with sufficient mana, enough to penetrate even a predator's skull, Zephyr unleashed a colossal mana punch that consumed the predator entirely. As the unit's leader, Goat held the power to influence Zephyr's transfer to the hunting team with just a word to the Human Resources Department. He was convinced that Zephyr was attempting to impress him for that very reason. However, Goat knew he wasn't in dire need, and beating a simple kobold dungeon wouldn't be enough to win him over. Unbeknownst to Goat, Zephyr didn't aim to impress him. With Zephyr's abilities, recognition, and advancement were inevitable. However, as of now, 
He remained a miner unable to enter a dungeon without permission. Hence, he sought Gota's help to gain access. Gota, we need to talk, Zephyr requested. The scene shifts to a forest where a man, clearly worn out from running, finds himself surrounded by deceased comrades. In a state of panic, he pleads for his life, insisting that he wasn't part of the deceased group. He tries to remind the temple's imposing figure of their shared past within the temple. Desperately, he calls out to the leader, Sahak, urging him to believe that he doesn't worship the god of demons. Ignoring the man's pleas, Sahak commanded with a menacing glare, Crush him! The massive man swung his flail, obliterating the fellow comrade. The lifeless body twitched and a centipede slithered out from his mouth. Sahak infused his sword with mana, swiftly slicing the centipede as his blade gleamed. That was a marked centipede, Sahak declared, licking his sword, certain that the fallen man was a worshiper of Tartarus. You killed seven team members just to catch one rat. That's a seven to one ratio. Doesn't that seem rather inefficient? said a shadowy figure seated behind a desk. Tapping his finger in annoyance, the figure known as Inquisitor Matthias scrutinized Sahak. You know how these people operate, Sahak replied. Inquisitor Matthias, we can assume that the other unit members have already been converted. There's only one month till the raid. If we don't root out the heretics hidden in the temple as soon as possible, we'll regret it later. All right, I'll handle things with the hunting team, but I expect tangible results in return. Remember, you're representing me. Don't bring me any embarrassment, instructed Inquisitor Matthias. Yes, sir, responded Sahak with a smug smirk on his face. The Human Resources Department. All right, Captain Goat from Recon Unit D. Please begin by completing the application. Who are you nominating for a transfer and what's their current role? Inquired the clerk seated behind the desk. This is Zephyr. He's currently working in the mining team, just joined this week, Goat explained. Understood, just a moment, responded the clerk. If you recommend someone from another department for transfer to your unit, they'll be associated with your team. If any errors by that person affect your unit's performance negatively, it could impact your chances of receiving bonuses or promotions. Do you agree to these conditions? Yes, I agree, said Gota, offering a smile to the clerk. Of course I would. On the flip side, if he excels, all the recognition will come to me, he chuckled. Life's all about luck. Gota couldn't believe his luck. The previous day in the dungeon, he queried, What do you mean? You want me to act like the fight with the Predator never happened? That's correct, responded Zephyr. Is it because you want to claim the monster's bodies? Only the Predator. I'll leave the kobolds. You can simply inform your superiors that it was a kobold den, Zephyr said with a grin. In dungeons, you come across various treasures like monster remains, mana stones, and items. However, temple slaves aren't permitted to possess any of these findings. Everything found by slaves belongs to the temple. For a warrior slave on the hunting team, the only hope is a reward for clearing the dungeon and a bonus based on the loot's value. I could make more money if I sold this to a broker, mused Zephyr. That's impossible. Haven't you forgotten? There's a standby unit waiting outside to prevent that, remarked Gote. Besides, even if we strike a deal, the follow-up unit will inspect the area for items anyway. Ah, got it. How about this? Zephyr rested his hand on the predator's carcass. There seemed to be something here. A light emitted from the predator and vanished in an instant. There's nothing here now, Zephyr mentioned. Goat was amazed. Does he have an inventory? He pondered. It was hard to believe. Most inventories can barely accommodate a few items, yet Zephyr made that colossal monster vanish. Even the bloodstains on the ground disappeared. Gota, don't you aspire for a promotion? Zephyr stated, his fist clenched. I'll conquer three additional dungeons for you. You can distribute the spoils among yourselves. In return, I'd like to claim the monster remains. The count of dungeons cleared every quarter especially the battles undertaken, significantly influences the assessments for promotions. This encompasses even lower-tier dungeons like Kobold Dens. As the recon unit, we seldom engage in battles. That's why I've remained a unit leader for the past three years, Gota reflected silently. Having someone as formidable as Zephyr on his team alters everything. The recon unit holds the initial entry into dungeons, granting them exclusive access without interference. 
If they successfully clear multiple dungeons with a small group, it elevates Goat's status as the unit leader. Goat desires a promotion, while Zephyr seeks monetary gains. It's a mutually beneficial arrangement. Their primary concern is evading detection while executing their plan. If I manage to sell the Predator at a good price, I can clear off my debt easily. I wish to leave this temple as soon as possible, but there's something I must accomplish here, Zephyr thought to himself. The Temple Knights are planning a major raid in about a month, aiming for an item that will create waves across the land. I have to be part of that mission at any cost. I must obtain that item to alter the future. Your registration is done, Zephyr. You're officially part of the hunting team now. Here's your ID tag. Take it to the armory to get your basic gear. Zephyr missed joining the last expedition because he joined the hunting team after the participant list was finalized. They only select a maximum of 20 individuals from the hunting team. To be picked, you need exceptional talent or influential connections. Zephyr had a strategy in mind. The only uncertainty was when he could execute it. You'll find the armory on the first floor of that building, where there will be a line of people. I need to visit the hospital briefly to check on Dale and Marco's injuries. If you have any belongings to retrieve, Gote was cut off by approaching footsteps. Quickly, Gote instructed Zephyr to lower his head and bow. As the five temple knights walked past, everyone halted and respectfully lowered their heads. Those are the Inquisitor's official agents. They are slaves who directly serve the Inquisitor. It's best to treat them as superiors, not fellow slaves. They have the authority to label anyone as heretics and punish them without a trial. People have been taken away for minor reasons like bumping into them or not showing proper respect. Especially Sahak, the mad hound at the front. He joined the Inquisitor's agents to pursue his desire for violence. Once he sets his sights on someone, he never lets them escape. Be cautious around him, advised Gota. Hey, you there, Sahak called out. Goat was startled. Did he hear me? He was frightened. Excuse me for a minute, something is bothering me, Sahak said, turning to face Goat and Zephyr. He pointed at Zephyr and said, You, miner, I'm Sahak, an agent of the Inquisitor. Tell me your name and position, as he removed his hood. Sir, this is Zephyr. He was just transferred to my team. If there's any problem, as the team leader, I'll make sure to... Gota started, but was interrupted abruptly. Hey, shut up. I didn't ask you, Sahak snapped, his gaze furious and intense. Goat felt a suffocating aura grip him, causing his body to shiver. Gasping, he muttered, What is this murderous aura? The pressure was released and he staggered backward. Now I'm certain. I can sense it just by his presence. Most others wouldn't notice, but my senses are sharp. This guy holds serious power. He's in minor attire, yet he was recently shifted to the hunting team. It implies he previously worked in the mining team. New slaves undergo tests before station assignment, including physical and mana assessments. Those with combat skills usually get noticed since the hunting team is always in need. And yet, someone as strong as him was placed in the mining team and then nominated for a transfer to the hunting team. Something doesn't add up, Sahak pondered to himself. The knights formed a circle around Zephyr, blocking any escape routes while Sahak approached him. He might be strong, but we've got this under control. Answer my questions and don't even think about lying. Sahak smirked menacingly. Zephyr chuckled inwardly. Who does this dickhead think he is? He's practically serving himself up on a platter for me.